2 Corinthians 2. Please join me in the privilege of prayer. Heavenly Father, this word is your word. It is how you have spoken to us. It's how you speak to us today. It is complete. It is inerrant. It is all sufficient because it comes from you. You are complete and perfect and inerrant and all sufficient. And so we thank you for your word and we ask that you would, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, help us. Not only today when we look at your word together, but every time we're in your word, whether it's corporately or by ourselves, that you would bless us and help us to better understand your word, to rightly handle it, and then to not just hear the word and rightly handle the word, but to do it also. That you would teach us your statutes, teach us your word, and then help us to walk in its ways. Uh, We long for that. Uh, We long for you, and so we ask that uh, you'd bless this time we spend together in your word today, for we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Picking up in verse 12, uh, going back to what we talked about last week, Paul was unable to or chose not to go to the city of Corinth in the same timeline that he originally said he was going to do, and oh boy, did all the enemies of Paul take advantage of that. Because then, as you can imagine, and this happens today, right? Somebody does anything, and the enemies of that person are going to try and twist that, turn that, use that against Paul. So all the false teachers that were in the city of Corinth who don't like Paul are going... And these aren't godly people who have a problem with Paul, by the way, okay? These are not godly people who have a problem with Paul. These are ungodly false teachers who are going to use every single opportunity to discredit Paul in order for themselves to have... um, ungodly gain. Gain in fame, gain in fortune. They're not really in it for the right reasons, right? And so Paul has to defend himself, sadly, uh, but he has to defend himself. And so that's what he was starting to do last week as we went through verses 1 through 11. And he kind of continues on that here as we go on. He's going to say what he did on his way to Macedonia. He said, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, Even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. So Paul is a true man of God. He is an apostle of Christ. He wants to minister as much as possible. He is always going to be interested in ministering wherever there's an open door. That's Paul. That's Paul. He's the real deal. He knows that that whenever God opens a door, all he has to do is walk through it. He doesn't know what the results will be, does he? None of us do. But you know who holds the results in his hands. When we see a door opened, you can have faith that God will use that for his purposes whatever way he wishes, right? Sometimes Paul went through an open door and he was beaten, all right? There was other times where he went through that open door and he was thrown in jail. And there was other times he went through that open door and everything was received and it was just the most wonderful experience ever. But in everything I just listed, God was at work. Even in his jailing, even in his beating, all of those things were used by God. Because you might have somebody who hears the truth about Jesus Christ, just to give one example. Somebody hears the truth about Jesus Christ, but they're skeptical. Eh, doesn't sound right. Too good to be true. I don't believe in that stuff. Everybody I've ever heard talk about this Jesus guy, they're not really all in. And you would think that if that's true, that person would be all in. I hear this argument from Muslims all the time because all they see are wishy-washy Christians. And so they say, why should I believe what you believe? Everybody who is a Christian is wishy-washy. But then what if somebody like that meets a Paul who's not wishy-washy? who is willing to do whatever and sees all things being used by God for his good and God's glory. What a game changer. This this person who is beating Paul, perhaps Paul gives him the gospel and he doesn't believe it and he beats him even more severely. But through the acceptance of that and the the fact that he held steadfast to his faith, faith, through that, you can see how God would use that to work in the heart of a jailer or to work in the heart of a skeptic, or to work in the heart of many different people. That's our God. That's our God. Remember, all the way back in the beginning of 2 Corinthians, in in chapter 1, we talked about God is a God of comfort and mercy. And not just comfort there, there, there. 
hard thing you're going through there, there. But the God of comfort in the sense that, oh, he comforts you, but he strengthens you, he encourages you, he fills you, he equips you to endure and get through all those things. And let me remind you, lest you forget, this world, this life that we have right now in this world is as hard as it's going to be for you. Paul recognized that. All the apostles recognized that because every time there was persecution, hardship, difficulties, trouble, what did they do? They reminded the people of God of God's promises of heaven and an eternity where there is no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, just perfect peace and obedience and faith forever and ever and ever and ever without end. And so this short little dressing room for eternity does not compare to what awaits us. And that was the encouragement time and time again. And it's the same encouragement for us today. Absolutely the same. When God sends forth one of his laborers, and it could be an apostle like Paul, I mean, they're, they're done now, but it could be an apostle back in the time of the apostles, it could be a pastor, it could be a layperson, it could be any one of God's people. When he calls them into labor to work for him, you know that there's some kind of harvest is going to happen. Even if you don't understand it or you don't get to see the end of it, we can trust the one who began a work in us or begins a work in someone else will be faithful to complete it. You and I just might not get to see that whole process. You might just get to be the person who shares the gospel with that person. You don't even get to see them accept it. You might be somebody who waters uh, a seed that was planted by somebody else and you don't know that. You're just watering it, faithfully just doing what the Lord says to do and you don't get to see anything other than the pouring of the water and you don't know what happens after that. Or you might be the person who gets to enjoy harvest, to be with that person when, when they have their conversion, when they profess their faith in Jesus Christ. Or you might get to be somebody who sees the fruit of that after months or years of that profession of faith, having that fruit being shown so you see the genuineness of that salvation, you might be any one of those parts, or you might be multiples of those. But we know that God is at work, and he is a sovereign God. Don't, I love that word, sovereign, because it really explains who God is. He is in control of everything. 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 Isn't that comforting? It's very comforting. Paul understood that fact. And so he could be comforted knowing that when he would write, he'd say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. How can he say that? He's a prisoner of Rome. The only way Paul can say that is because he understands that, just like Jesus did, the only reason I'm in your possession is because God has allowed it and he's purposed it for his goodwill and pleasure. Paul understood it. So did Jesus. He's standing before Pilate. Pilate's toying with him, saying, don't you understand? I have the power of life and death. And Jesus understands the only reason that I'm before you and you have any power over me at all is because it has been given to you. It's been allowed by God or purposed by God. Paul understands that too, that God is sovereign. Therefore, whatever God, if God's in control of everything, then whatever is happening to me, God is either purposing it, purposing it or he's allowing it. One or the other. And he's not a mean God. He's not an absentee God. He's not a forgetful God. He's none of those things. He's a loving God and a perfect God. So if he's allowing that, if that stuff's happening, you should allow yourself to have trust and faith in him, that he's using it for his glory and your good, that all things that, that God allows or that God purposes are, are for our good and his glory. So he's talking about how all these things in this letter. And, and, and he wants to minister. He wants to go to Corinth. He wants to go to, to Troas. He wants to go to Macedonia. I have no rest for my spirit, though, he says, because of everything that's going on. He's a true pastor, okay? He's not why He doesn't have a, a, a little clicker. True story. Somebody told me, you've got to go to this church. You're going to love this church. When I first came to Ohio, you've got to go to this church. You're going to love this pastor. So I drove out there with a friend and to meet this pastor and see this church. And uh, we go out there, and the pastor wasn't there, but the secretary was, and she was just, oh, yes, you would love him. He's great. And I don't know why she told me this, but she said, in the course of kind of explaining the church and all this, she said, oh, yes, pastor, I forget his name, has a clicker. And when people come in, he greets them with one hand, and then he clicks the clicker with the other. And I was just taken aback by that, like, wait, what? 
You mean, like, I don't, again, I have no idea why she shared this with me at all. And so, so I'm like, so he's like, welcome. Click. Oh, you know, Jane and her husband. Click, click, right? Hey, uh, Scotty, it's so good to see you. I'm glad that you got over your whatever, your, your illness. Click. Isn't that weird? I just thought that was weird. Like, there's something weird about that. There's something wrong with that. You know what I expect a pastor to do? Hey, how are you? Welcome. Hey, how, you know. Real connection can't be faked, right? Real care, real concern can't be faked, right? There's other pastors who they like to keep distance, right? You, you see them on Sunday. Maybe if you are fast enough, you might catch them in the handshaking line as you're walking out the door, right? You, if you're lucky. Not that I believe in luck because, again, God's sovereign. But you might do that. And I, why? I don't get that. I've always, I don't know who came up with this analogy, but it is 100% biblical and true that sheep are stupid and you and i are likened to sheep okay so and it's god who calls us this okay so it's not me calling us this it's god who calls us this and sometimes sheep are so uh, derpy that they forget to eat they literally will forget to eat that's kind of you see that's kind of dumb it's kind of derpy so what does a good shepherd do well every sheep has the wool right so every sheep looks healthy, but what does a good shepherd do? Just say, oh, they all look healthy? Or does a good shepherd go up, get close to the sheep, and feel through? To feel through the wool, to make sure that that sheep doesn't just look okay, but is truly emaciated underneath, but to make sure that the sheep is actually healthy, right? The only way you can really do that is to be close to the sheep, right? And so Paul is this kind of minister. Paul is this type of pastor. He is close. You know that when he went and preached, he wouldn't just be done when he would go to a synagogue or he would go to the place of speaking in a town. He didn't just speak and then, you know, go to the Holiday Inn and, and kick back for the next eight to ten hours. That's not what he did. When he was done speaking to the crowds, he would go to people's homes and teach and disciple and open up the scriptures even more there. That's something that somebody does who loves God and who loves Christ and who loves his people. That's Paul. That's Paul. And because he's that type of pastor, because of the problems that are happening in the church in Corinth, his spirit is not at rest. He, uh, his, he, he is bothered by this, by these problems. He has um, great concern. Great concern. He wants to be able to deal with that. He wants to be able to deal with that. He has a troubled heart and a troubled mind. He wants to see Titus. When he's troubled, he wants to be around those people who encourage him and that he can encourage them and that they can encourage him. Timothy, Titus, both of these young men were encouragements to Paul. He wants to, he wants to meet up with Titus, not only to be encouraged himself and to encourage Titus, but because he wants to know if Titus has any information about Corinth because he's so worked up. And he's worked up not because he's like, they're making me look bad. No, he's worked up because he loves them. Strange as that sounds, I understand. I know, I know that today that is not the norm, right? That's not the norm for a pastor. But God equips his church with a perfect number of genuine, real, loving pastors who are the under shepherds of the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. There's, there's, there's the perfect amount. Not one too many, not one too less. There's the perfect amount. So they're out there. There are loving pastors like Paul out there who want and actually genuinely care when the people of God are in danger, trouble. He goes on, even though he's feeling this way, and that's why I lingered on this, just to really kind of drive home the, the point of he's a, good, he's a good servant of God. He's a good pastor. He's a good shepherd but also what he does with feeling, he feels that way. He's concerned, he's a little anxious, he's, all this stuff is going on. And so what does he do with that? That's going to be a good lesson for us, right? What does Paul do when he feels that way? Well, verse 14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. 
What, what, does, what does a real, true man of God do when he's feeling the way Paul was feeling in that moment? He looks to Christ and the triumph that is in and through Christ. He's got it under control. Didn't Jesus say that I will, I will make my church, I will, I will create, I will found, I will create and keep my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? He knows that the triumph is Christ. The victory is Christ's. So he deals with this false criticism from the false teachers. He deals with all of this fickleness, all the sin, all the problems that's happened in the church of Corinth and his, his concern for them and his love for them. What's he do when he's feeling this way and he's all wrapped up like this? All because of his concern for them and the changing of the travel plans and he's explained himself and given his reasons for not arriving when he previously said he was going to arrive. It wasn't, it wasn't maniacal in the, in the way that the false teachers were trying to label it and stuff. He does all that. What does he do? He reminds himself and the readers of this letter that he is going to follow Christ as his leader. Christ is the general. And he is but the soldier. What's he going to do? He's going to follow Christ. And that's what the Corinthians should do too. My plan, Paul is saying, all this stuff is going on. I wanted to see Titus. I want to go to Macedonia. I want to see you guys. All these things are going on. And there's the uncertainty of what's happening in Corinth. And all this stuff is going on. You want to know what I'm going to do? You want to know what my plans are? My plans are to follow Jesus. Simple. Simple. And effective. Because does Paul know exactly what's going to happen? Do we know what tomorrow holds? But we know who holds tomorrow. We know what Christ does. So when he says, you know what I'm going to do? You know what plans I'm going to follow? I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's what we should all do. That's what the Corinthians should do. That's what we should all do. Follow Jesus. So he looks at all these troubles. He looks at all these uncertainties. And what a strange thing to do. What's he do? Thanks be to God. <laughs> I love it. Thanks be to God. What, what are you talking about, Paul? You're having anxiety. You're stressed. You're all this stuff. Thanks be to God. Now, how can a person say such a thing? Only, and how can a person, when we talked about contentment in Bible study on Thursday, how can a person be content? You can only be truly content by putting faith and trust in God. And so when Paul says this, he says, I'm, instead of looking below, I'm looking up. I'm looking above. And I'm going to put my trust in God, and I am thankful I can do that. Thanks be to God. It's the only way you can do that. And Christians are the only ones who can do that. A genuine born-again Christian is the only person who's going to be rewired that way to be able to do that. Right? Because that certainly is not a worldly thing. People of the world do not think that way, do not thank, aren't thankful for troubles or for uncertainty or any of these things. But we can be because God is sovereign and we trust him and put our faith in him. So he's now taking what was an, an unjoyful experience and turning it into something that he finds joy in. Crazy. But that's us. That's us. I saw a video. I, I, I have not been able to refine it. I saw a video where a man, when he was 9, 10, 11 years old, uh, he was a perfectly healthy boy, and then when he was 9, 10, 11 years old, he gained some kind of disease that basically petrifies your internal muscles and organs. And so mostly the muscles and the tendons. So he was basically um, petrifying. He was seizing. And by the time he was in, I think he was in his 40s when this video was taken, all he could move was his, just a little bit of his neck and above. That's all he could move. Everything else was stuck and like, like frozen. And he described it like, as it happens, it feels like magma running through your veins and that it was just excruciatingly painful. And so here he is on this hospital gurney on this stage and he's talking about all these things. And he says, you know, but I give God glory and praise. What? What are you talking about? The world would look at this and be like, why? Look at what God has done to you. Look at what God has allowed to happen. You know what he did? He said, I give God the glory and the praise because I'm grateful that I can still look up at night and see the stars. I get chills even recounting it. I just think to myself, yes, that's somebody who gets it. 
That's somebody who gets it, not because of his faculties were so sharp or he was so brilliant or anything. He didn't get it that way. He got it because God opened his eyes, right? Opened his ears, opened his eyes, opened his heart. That's what Jesus tells the apostles uh, and his disciples in Matthew 13, 11, right? Why do we understand what you're saying in these parables, but the others do not? And Jesus says, because to you it has been given to see and to hear and understand. So that's why this guy got it too. And it was just beautiful that here, with every opportunity in the world to complain about his pain and his suffering, instead, he glorifies God, realizing that God owes us nothing and that he was grateful that God allowed him to still be able to look up and see the stars. And they asked him, well, what's your favorite song? He goes, oh, I, I can only imagine. I love that song. I can only imagine. It's my favorite song. And so they surprised him by bringing out the band that plays that song. And the band allowed him to sing that song with them coolest thing ever super cool and of course his his voice was not the greatest of course right but in heaven i bet you that thing it, it must have rang like a perfect bell it was just just awesome two weeks later that man passed and went into glory and one it, so right perspective right joy joy even in the difficult situations because of your great trust in god not because you're going to figure it out or you're so resourceful or you're going to figure you're going to find a way or you're so strong no you're none of those things right you know who's strong god is strong we're weak you, you don't compare the measuring is not you measuring yourself against another person the measuring is you measure yourself against god and when you do that you realize you're weak when you do that you realize you're sinful and wicked and unholy and stupid Foolish, derpy, all those things. When you look at God, he's our strength. And when you do that, you realize that he's the one who's in control. I'm going to stop trying to hold the keys to the universe. I'm going to let God hold them where they truly are and where they truly belong. You can have joy in any circumstance because nothing about you at all. It's all because of God, a sovereign, loving God. And that you are in a privileged position because he allows you to see that, no matter what you're going through, there is triumph in Christ. It is, it is glorious to realize and to understand that you're being led by a sovereign God, not just now, not just then, all times, at all times, through all things. So Paul takes this image from the Roman world. And he says, uh, Jesus is the victorious, conquering general, just like how the Romans would have a triumphal parade. And perhaps you've seen um, movies or you've seen you know, stuff on the History Channel when it's not playing stuff about aliens. Maybe every once in a while they show history and you see the Roman triumph. When a Roman general would come back from a great triumph, they would have the triumphal parade where they would march through the city and all the Roman people would be there and right and flower petals right and just great triumph and it was only given to successful generals as they returned from a conquest paul is using this imagery to talk about jesus he is a triumphant general he is always going to conquer he always has the victory so you can imagine in the ancient world one of the most just amazing spectacles you could see and paul is using this you would have roman officials you would have the emperor there roman officials the senate all the all the bigwigs would be there and all these people are their spoils from the conquered land are being marched through the the enemies that they conquered are being marched through all this to show the full victory of that general that it was complete victory and now do you see why Paul is using this as an illustration to talk about Christ? Christ's victory is complete. It is triumphant. It is great. All this he's talking about. This is the picture that's in his mind. Christ marching triumphant, conquering the entire world. And if he is your commanding general, you, by way of him, also have victory and triumph by way of him you must understand that that the way god does things is different than the world god sees victory in that man who was frozen there was triumph and victory in that man whereas the world would say what a sad soul how poor, poor him god abandoned him 
No, he didn't. Quite the opposite. And so you must understand that God doesn't do things the way the world does things. So triumph and glory and conquest in the eyes of God might seem quite different than the world. But ultimately, when the world comes to an end and Christ comes back to rule and to reign, everything will be put in its place by him. And we will, who follow him, we who are soldiers in his army, will enjoy the same victory as he does. Except we didn't win it. He won it. You ever see those movies where they're like two big groups of dirty, dusty guys and you have spear shields, right? And they march, 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 and you have one group on one side, one group on the other side, and the leaders come out and they go, let's do it the old way. Your greatest champion against our greatest champion. And whoever wins, they, the, they win everything. Yes, let's do that. Okay, march, 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 march. They go back and they send their champions out, right? Whichever champion won, the entire army benefited, correct? Absolutely. It's the same with Christ. He is the champion. And because he wins, and he always wins, and, because, and by the way, it's not close, all right? It's not, it's not Satan versus Jesus, and it's 49-49, it's the last second, and Satan slips on a banana peel, and Jesus gets a lucky uppercut, and yay! No. 100 to 0, okay? Satan can't do a thing unless God allows it. You remember the story of Job, yes? You can do this, but you can go no further, God tells Satan. You must spare his life. It's not Satan going, I can do whatever I want. Mm -mm. No. God is 100% sovereign in control. So even what happens to Job is allowed by God. And so that's a pretty powerful guy. He is 100% victorious. It's 100 to 0 every single time. It never changes. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. And so we enjoy that victory because of what Christ has done. Kind of matches what we talked about in the reading, doesn't it? It's because of his work. It's our faith in his work. We're saved by works in a sense, but only the works of Christ and our faith in that. So Paul sees us sharing in this triumph of Christ. Christ is the captain of the Lord's army, and, and, and he, is, he just gets to march in to the city in that glorious parade with him as a soldier. That's the Jesus that leads us. That 100 to 0, perfect, sovereign God, that's who our leader is. That's why Paul has such great confidence. It's not that, oh, I can really take a beating. Don't worry. I'm good at it. I can take a beating. Oh, cold floors, I love them. Rats running across my feet, my favorite. Don't worry about it. I can handle it. He's not talking like that. He also, it's also why Paul never says, please pray that I get out of prison. Did you ever notice that? Never says that. You know, he does say, oh, bring, bring the scrolls. <laughs> bring the scrolls. Bring the word of God. Take this letter and bring it to the church. I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus, he understood, who's really in control. And that, hey, if God wanted him out of prison, he'd be out of prison that second. Whenever it was deemed God's will, it would happen. And Paul had a firm belief in the sovereignty of God in that sense. God leads us. He says that, that uh, he leads us and he, there's a fragrance of his knowledge. Uh, you think of fragrance in Paul's mind, he's thinking of no doubt in, like incense. That would have been common in those Roman parades as well, men walking with incense burning. In Paul's mind, that fragrance is like the knowledge of God, which you can sense and smell as that triumphal parade goes by. You know how a scent can really hold a memory can't it? There's times where I'll be driving by a field and I'll smell a particular type of grass and it's like I'm in the third grade again. Just I can imagery of the third grade recess just hits my brain like different smells have different memories. It's really powerful. Hopefully it's a good smell that has a powerful. But here Paul is saying that the knowledge of God is like a sweet perfume. That knowledge of the sovereignty of God and everything that we've just discussed in these few moments is like a sweet perfume. And it brings back memories. Memories of God's faithfulness and his power and his sovereignty. And yes, he wins the victory. 
And because he wins the victory, I too will share in victory. So he's remembering all these things. It reminds, all these things remind me of God and Christ. And there I find my joy in any circumstance. Mind you, this is not how, it, it doesn't work this way. Um, somebody comes up and kicks me in the shin. And I go, oh, thank you, Lord. Right? Is that how it works? Somebody comes and says, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, your house burned down last night. Your immediate response is not, thank you, thanks be to God. That's not your immediate response, is it? And, and so that's not what Paul is saying here, okay? He's not setting you up for some unachievable standard. He's saying that no matter what, this is the knowledge that you come to, like a sweet fragrance. It reminds you of who's in control and what that really means in, in any situation. But it's not going to be your guttural first reaction most of the time. But what does the Holy Spirit do? Oh, well, he will lead you there. He's doing it right now through the exposition of his word, that he can use that at a future date, or maybe even today. Verse 15. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? In other words, the, this, this, this imagery I'm telling you about, Paul says, means different things to different people. So he's saying, to one, the aroma of death leading to death, and the other, the aroma of life leading to life. The, this Roman parade, the Roman parade would be burning incense, and that would point to other gods, the Roman gods, pagan gods. And to a Roman, that was wonderful, right? They saw no problem in that. They might have even really enjoyed it, right? But to a, 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 but to a, a captive prisoner, they're not going to like that smell, right? They understand it means their death. They understand that they're being marched in this parade to be shown off as victors of the spoils and that they're going to be put to death. So they have quite a different view of the Roman incense than the Romans did, didn't they? Absolutely. You're, we are a fragrance of Christ to God. That's what we are. God, in the, in the, Roman, in the Roman parade, triumph parade, this is a pleasing thing to the emperor. He would see all these things and he would be pleased. I'm pleased with the victory of the general. I'm pleased with all the spoils of war. I'm pleased with all these prisoners and we'll be putting them to death soon. I'm pleased with all this. In the same way, God the Father is pleased with his faithful servant, the, the general, the leader of his armies, Jesus Christ. He's pleased with that. His faithfulness and obedience is a sweet-smelling aroma in the nostrils of God. That's so you have to understand he's talking, using an illustration of something that's familiar to them, the Roman triumphal parade, and using that to describe this is what it's like in this way. We are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, among those who are perishing. Every one of us who are being saved are amongst others who are not being saved and they're perishing. So we are like a sweet aroma to the Lord. There are those who receive the gospel and those who reject the gospel. The gospel is a means of salvation to those who receive it, and it's a means of destruction to those who reject it. Same, same thing, two different results based on what camp you're in. Verse 16, to one a fragrance from death to death and to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For if we are not like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. What's the effect of, of gospel preaching? It'll take people to genuine life who receive it, but those who deny it leads to death. There is uh, no one in your own power is going to be able to save yourself. You can't. Again, the, 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 the victor is Christ, and you are either marching in his army behind him or you're a captive being trampled into, the, into Rome with them. Do you see? You're on, you're on one side or the other. You're either in the, the losing camp and you're, you're one of the slaves that are being marched into their death or you're part of the victory 
You're part of the victory capturing general's army. Those who put their faith in Christ through the gospel of Jesus Christ, those are conquering soldiers marching in victorious because their general was victorious. He won the battle. He did all the work. But those who don't enjoy that gospel, who reject it, well, they're like conquered peoples. Their doom is certain. Is that not the gospel? Is that not why we warn people about the eternal judgment? That judgment is coming? That God is not an absentee landlord? That you will, we will all stand before him one day and we will be before his throne and either you will have to account by your works and be unsuccessful or you will have victory not because of your works, but because of the victorious work of Christ. We know which side is the better side to be on. Who is sufficient for these things? God, he, Paul is thinking of the greatness of God's plan. He wonders, is anyone sufficient to play a role in it? No one is. Who's sufficient to, to be in this play? No one. It's just, Christ, again, it's a Christ-glorifying, Christ-exalting statement. Christ Christ, Christ, he is sufficient. It's not, I need to work so I can be sufficient. No, you will never be sufficient. It's, it's not, I'm almost there. If I can just get a little clean. No, you are insufficient. I am insufficient. We are insufficient. This is why God sent Christ. Because we can't do it, and God's fully aware of that. If any of us were sufficient for these things, God would not have needed to send Christ. There's not a super Christian out there, okay? Just poor, weak, pitiful men and women of God who are just grasping on to him like the last uh, life, life, what do they call that? Lifesaver? Not a lifesaver. Yeah, lifesaver, lifesaver. Life, 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 last light saver, life saver. Thank you. <laughs> Man, it's in there. I swear it's in there. It's just, it's just driving too fast. I can't catch it. It's the last life preserver on the boat. Thank you, Rick. He came because he had to. There was no other way for us to be saved. No one else could live the perfect life and be the perfect sacrifice and atonement for sin. Our sins are eternal. You understand that, right? That even if you only sin once, you have sinned eternally against an eternal God. So that's why you can't pay your own price. And that's why when people go to hell, it's not a reformatory. When God sends people to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever, it's not a reformatory. It's not where 10,000 years from now, people are going to, whew, man, I'm glad that's over. I finally get it. Praise be to Jesus. Nope, it's not a reformatory. They are paying an eternal price for an eternal sin. It will never end. This is why the gospel is so important and to warn people about the danger of sin and the eternal danger of sin that all of us are in and that there's only way one way to be saved from that sin and it's not sufficient in any of us it's only sufficient in christ and that's what paul is saying praise be to god thanks be to god that, that god has knows all this understands all this made a way for us and gains the victory himself and we we who do not deserve victory get to enjoy victory purely by faith and trust in him who did win the victory That's, this is all, you see how, isn't it clear as we're just reading through what, what, what God wrote through Paul? Isn't it clear his care, his love, and his concern? The passion, you know, like the passion, like how can you not have passion about the sovereignty of God and his victory and, and the gospel and all these things I'm talking about? How can you not? He says, for we are not as so many peddling the word of God. The idea of peddling is like, oh, you're, you're doing it uh, you're watering it down, or you're modifying it, or changing it, or you're, um, you're dealing with it in a way that's like adultery. You're cheating it, you're watering it down, you're using pragmatism to, well, it's not quite what I think the people would like, so let me just, I'm just going to change a little bit. He says, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing this for that kind of gain. We don't, we're not looking for bigger profits or more butts in the seats. That's not what this is about. We're not doing that. We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. We're not doing that, Paul says. We do this out of sincerity. 
And that's why he was willing to be beaten, held in jail, all that, because it was out of sincerity. Sincerity. He really believed this. They had pure and transparent um, motives. Nothing, nothing hidden. He could bear the test of anyone taking what his ministry was and holding it up to the light with no problem, no hidden motives, no hidden agendas. And he says, not like many, or in other words, not like the majority. Sadly, this is true today, just as it was true in Paul's time. That the majority of people are false teachers or philosophers who are trying to operate hand in hand with the world under human wisdom instead of just faithfully teaching and preaching the word of God. They're peddling or they're corrupting what God intended to be pure. And that's what false teachers do. They come into the church, they're clever, they smile, right? They know that you shouldn't, you know, come in with your shirt unbuttoned too many buttons down, right? They know oh, it looks better if you button it up the way you should. No, I should make sure my tie is ironed. And they think of all the stupid things, right? Oh, I need to make sure my tie is tied, right? And it's, uh, everything's ironed and I need to make sure all this is done. And did my teeth whitening come in? Because that's important. I need to make sure all this stuff is going on. And they think of all that stuff, but they care not for the purity of the gospel. They care not for the truth and the teaching and the handling of God's word. They don't care about that stuff. They'll happily mix pagan traditions with Christianity. They don't care. They'll happily take something that the world says is a great idea and mingle it with what God says is how he wants church to be done. They do this because they are seeking dishonest gain, personal profit, personal gain, prestige, fame, power. We speak, he says, in the sight of God and in Christ. Paul understands that everything he does, and this is true for all of us too, this might be one of those heavy gulp moments, that everything we do is in the face of God, is before the face of God. And he sees everything? Yes. He heard my thought? Yes. He saw what I did? That Yes. 40 years ago, though, it was 40, yes. The kind of stuff, see, God sees everything, okay? It's the kind of stuff that he sees everything. And so it's kind of like the stuff that if, if, if we could, if you could have a VCR or a projector that goes right into my heart and my mind, and you could see everything that I've ever thought, said, and done, and it was projected on a screen, I would run out of here, just like all of you would, and never want to be seen by you again, because, oh, the horrors. Oh, the embarrassment, the shame. And Paul understands, this is how we live. We live in front of God. Now, now that sounds awful, right? That, oh, God has seen all that. But forget, forget that part as the most important. Remember this, he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. You know what won me over to Christ? It, it wasn't I read a scripture and the truth just, oh. It wasn't like knowledge won me over. It was his love that won me over. Now, you have to be careful because you don't want all love with no knowledge. You have to know what the love is and what it means and what his love is like and what he's like and, and why you're a sinner and why that's important to know that he's holy and you're not. And you need to know all that. So knowledge is important. You don't just throw knowledge out the window and go, love, love, love. You need to understand with knowledge what that love is, why it's important, why you need it. And so he showed me his, the knowledge of his word, but you know what he started with? He didn't start out with justification, sanctification, glorify. No, his love, his forgiveness and his love. So that when I realize, oh, I am awful, that I can then be rescued by the redemptive plan of his love through Jesus Christ for me. I don't know. I mean, I feel like when I get to heaven that I want to go up to Paul and be like, hey, you remember when you said you were the chief of sinners? I don't think so. Pretty sure I am. And we can, you know, slap at each other until. But you see what I mean? Like, it, it sounds bad until you realize, wait a minute, it is bad. But then it's the love of God that changes it and transforms it all around. I'm living and you're living in the, we live, speak, and think all in the sight of God, all in the face of God before him. Everything we're doing right now. Now that, you want some conviction to help you to, in the temptation to sin? There's some. Right? Next time you're thinking about doing something, lying, stealing, cheating, um, saying something hurtful, right? Um, cutting me off in traffic. Next time you think about doing that, just remember, 
Everything you do is in the sight of God. Everything. Watching something you shouldn't be watching, listening to something you shouldn't be listening to, eh, you're doing that in the sight of God. And be thankful that there's forgiveness. And be grateful that he's a sovereign God who offered that forgiveness and who knew you couldn't get it yourself and who knew you're so weak that you can't do it for yourself. You're completely helpless, and so am I. But that's why the sovereignty of God and his power is so great. Psalm 56, verses 10 and 3, and this is the end, says this, In God whose word I praise, and the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What shall man do to me? He's not concerned about, the psalmist isn't concerned about what man can do. He's thinking about God. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. I'm going to live for you, is what he's saying there. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. That phrase, walk before God, is the living in the sight of God. I walk before God, you walk before God. We're thinking, walk is live, your life. All of our life is lived in the sight of God, it's as if God's face is right here the entire time, which is scary when we're sinning, but is wonderful in every other sense, isn't it? It helps keep me from sinning. And it also helps keep me from being in despair. It's very encouraging. God sees everything. God saw me when my heart was, was hurt by what that person said. Yeah, God was there. God saw that. God saw what I did. You know, I denied, hey, I, I denied myself. I picked up my cross and I followed him for once. Yay! Did God see that? Yes. Right? Does God know me intimately? Yes. Knows my needs? Absolutely. Will he perfectly provide for me? Absolutely. Of course he will. Tell me what he doesn't do well. Just have faith and trust in him. Living in the sight of God or living before the face of God is a wonderful reminder that everything we do in life is all about God and that we live our whole lives to glorify and honor Him. That kind of makes life easier. If, you, if you're the type of person who has a hard time making decisions or you hate making decisions, good news. You know, God has told you what is right and what is wrong in His eyes, and so you can go to His Word and say, what does your Word say about the matter? And I will do what you say. He makes the decision for you. You're under the authority of God, and so am I. Our entire life is not the little pie, portion of the pie that you've set aside for him. The whole thing. The whole thing. We live our life before the Lord, knowing that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He perceives our every action. He perceives our every thought. <laughs> When I think of that, I, I am in prayer quite a bit. Lord, I'm so sorry I thought that about that person. Lord, I'm so sorry that my first gut reaction was rage or frustration or jealousy or covetousness or envy or pride. Lord, please forgive me. God created us for our, His glory and our lives should be lived for Him and His glory. He's the one who redeems us. He's the victor who is receiving the triumphal parade, and we're just happy to be there in the crowd behind him as he marches into victory. It's directly against what the world teaches today, by the way. The world does not teach that. Entertainment and media um, tell you that God is absent, that either there is no God or he does not care He's not around, or it doesn't matter, or you know what, it's all just uh, destructionism anyway. When this life is done and over, you're just going to die and go bye-bye, so it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. That's, that's part of Ecclesiastes. Those of you who have been coming to the evening service to, to hear Ecclesiastes, you realize that that's a life under the sun thinking, that none of this is worth anything, so what's it matter? None of this counts. That's the life under the sun perspective. But the eternal perspective is, oh no, there's a God who created me and all the universe and everyone will stand before him one day in judgment. So therefore, everything I think, say, and do does matter. There is purpose to life. But the predominant view of society today is that we should focus on the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. It's all about me, baby. Do what you think is right for you. Isn't that in every, seems like every new um, TV show or it's do what's right for you. Lie, cheat, steal, doesn't matter. Just do what's right for you. You're the most important. Popularity, fame, fortune, all acceptable pursuits. Just, just not living for God. That is unacceptable. You want to live for God? That is the only thing you can't do in today's society. You want to live for God? You're a fool. 
you're 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 just what's that word I was using? Derpy. In contrast, living for God is 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 just foolish, according to this world. But we know that if the world likes something, it's probably not pro God. Easy litmus test, right? If the world is like, yay, we really love this, it's probably not godly, right? Pretty safe to say it's probably not godly. Living in before the face of God and remembering that we do that reminds us that we live for an audience of one, the Lord. Walking before God and living to glorify him affects every area of your life. And when we do that way, when we live that way, when we think like Paul does, uh, pain, we see joy in pain. We see opportunity in difficulty. We see, see ways that we can live for Christ and tell others about him, even in our difficulty. Oh, our house burned down, that is awful. But this is an opportunity for the other people of Christ who are your brothers and sisters in the Lord to show their love for you by coming to your aid. It's an opportunity for you to show non-despair. Instead, you're thankful that God spared your life or spared your loved ones or your pets. And you see that, that God was merciful in this. And in the way that you respond to that difficulty and that tragedy, you are now able to point people to Christ, being ready with a reason for why you have the hope that you have. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for the victory that you have won for us. You know our hearts. You know our minds. And uh, sometimes I fear that we are too much like a yo-yo, that we come close to you and then we roll away. And then we come close to you again and then we roll away. Lord, help us to not be hypocritical, but to be genuine in our love and our faith and our trust in you. And uh, may your Holy Spirit do its perfect work in us, making us more like Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thoughts, questions, prayer requests, praise reports.